All right, yeah. everybody, welcome and thank you so much for coming. My name is Chris Olson. I run operations here at Amplify. Um, we are a startup accelerator. For those of you who don't know us, we do early stage investments and then also bring in those companies to help them grow with mentorships, strategic partners. Um, and a part of the program, you get to meet a lot of our mentors. Um, so every Wednesday night, we try to bring in one of our mentors to come in and give us a little bit more on you know, where they're from, what they're working on. Uh, I had the opportunity of meeting Gary about four months ago, probably now, uh, and he kind of gave me a little brief synopsis of what he's going to talk about tonight, and it was it was awesome. It's a perfect fit for uh, Wednesday night event. So um, I will get out of the way and let Gary Gary uh, get started. And thank you guys again for coming. Thanks, Chris. So uh, hi, my name is Gary Swart. I'm the CEO of a little company called Odesk, and Odesk is uh, has anybody heard of us? I get a sense. Oh, good. That's good news. So I don't have to tell you too much about us. We're the world's largest online workplace. What we essentially what we do is we think that e-work or online work is a lot like e-commerce, where e-commerce is about finding the right good, getting delivery of that good, and paying for that good via the web. Online work is about finding the right worker, getting delivery of the work, and paying for the work via the web. So what we thought is there should be an online online work company like there's an online commerce company like Amazon or eBay, we wanted to be that for the world of work. So it's about finding the right worker, getting delivery of the work, and paying for the work all via the internet. We, um, we've been around for a lot of years already, um, uh, seven years. Uh, and it takes a while to build up marketplace businesses. I'd love to talk about that. I'm sure you guys have a lot of questions, but one of our board members told me a long time ago, six plus years ago, he said, hey, get ready for the long haul. He, uh, he built a little, um, uh, e-commerce marketplace business called Open Table uh, for restaurant reservations. I'm sure most of you heard of it. So he's one of our board members, and he said, "Get ready for the long haul." And I thought he was didn't know what he was talking about. I was like, "We'll crush Open Table." Here we are, six plus years later, and I feel like we're just getting started with 560,000 clients and more than three million contractors on the platform. And I still feel like we're just getting it going. These businesses take a long time, so. I'd love to talk about Odesk and marketplace businesses. I can tell you about my journey from working at a big company like IBM and uh, deciding to throw away a great job and, and uh, go back into a startup and why I did that. I can talk about leadership. I can talk about hiring, building a business, funding. We can talk about whatever it is that you want. Uh, my goal really is to, um, was to have an excuse to come to LA and make the most out of my time. I've done that. I, uh, and I really want to make this valuable for you. I would consider this a win if you walked out and said, Amplify is awesome, uh, Gary was great, we learned a ton, and, and I get invited back another time. I just love helping people. I wish that uh, there were more people around six years ago that could have helped me and avoid a lot of mistakes. So with that, what I thought I'd do is rather than just start talking, what I thought I'd do is just throw it out to the audience and say, what is it that you want to talk about? Maybe I'll ask my friend here with paper and pen to just write the list yes, and then uh, we'll just go through the list and make sure that, that way I'm sure they add value for you. So what is it that you want to talk about? Two. One yeah. was, uh, how do you keep, how do you keep uh, the two parties from going around ODS to try to save money? Okay, the MIT word for that, I didn't go to MIT, a bunch of our workers did, is called disintermediation. Right. So how do you avoid disintermediation in a marketplace business? Great question. The, uh, I suppose the other one is that you guys are in a unique position to see how software development, web development, um, blog development, it happens. Yeah. Um, and I'm just curious on any sort of trends that you may have been seeing, uh, whether it's implementation of agile development, or, you know. Great, anything. yeah, I can speak to that as well. Good. Uh, maybe this like idea of like market liquidity, right? For you guys to be successful, you need people like, asking for services, but then you also need people like, giving the services, the services. How do you find a nice, you know, yeah. So marketplace liquidity, great. Thank you very much for doing it. more specific to that, kind of two or three best hacks that you did to, to create supply and demand. Awesome, yeah, I'll talk about that. Yeah, what else? Filtering out spam and... Yeah, so quality versus quantity, okay. I'd like to hear you talk about just the transition from corporate to... Transition from corporate, okay. I'd love to hear about why it takes so damn long. Why does it take so long? Yeah, okay. Good. Great question. Yeah, just building on that, uh, breaking through in the market. Breaking through. Yeah. How, how do you get known? That kind of thing. Yeah. Or, how, do you, right. how did you open the doors? Yeah. Good. Tips for hiring. 
Hiring tips, great. Okay, are you getting all this? By yeah, way? I got Thanks, it. I really appreciate yeah. you showing up tonight. <laughs> are we paying him? Yeah, we yeah, should yeah. Be so. yeah. Awesome. Competitors and how do we differentiate and how do you handle competitors? Awesome, great. Future I love this list. Keep it coming. We got it. we got a lot to talk about. Future plans for OS. Where you guys are Future to plans. Go. Where do you go from here? Yeah. Great. Yeah. I just want to say thank you because you saved me on my last project. Pay, not un, also unpaid. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. I, I love it. just that alone makes the trip worth it. Having somebody say thanks for I, business. Working awesome. with somebody in India is like ridiculous. Thank you very that would much. Be such a welcoming experience. Awesome. Talk a little bit about horizontal versus vertical. Great. Um, so I think right now you're, you're horizontal. How do you think you're on vertical? Love it. Great. Uh, are you profitable? And if you're not, you know, or if, if you are, how long does how long it take you to get profitable? And yep. If you're not, how long do you think it's going to take you to get profitable? Awesome question. Should we start with that? And then we'll go from there. All right. So then, just uh, so from a from a uh, housekeeping standpoint, if I'm on something and there's questions about it, should we answer questions or should we put them in a parking lot and come back? What do you guys? How do you want to handle it? So, just keep it flowing. So like, if there's questions on a topic, throw them out there, and we'll just we'll go deep on that. All right. I'm going to start with the corporate because that's I don't want to call it the boring stuff. But then we'll get. It seems like there's a lot of people who care about marketplaces, so we'll dig into that. But first, let's talk about my transition. So I, I started at a little company called Pure Software. And Pure was a developer diagnostic tools company. I was a sales guy there, inside sales guy, top performing sales rep, around my shoulders a little bit. It was a fantastic product to sell. If you're ever gonna go into sales, pick a product that sells itself where you just have to represent it. I mean, somebody gave me that advice once and they gave it to me after I was at Pure. But, Pick a product that sells itself that you just have to represent. Uh, Pure was that product. We went public in 90, uh, 96, something like that. We had a great IPO. We went out two weeks before Netscape. Company had a meteoric rise. We acquired a couple companies, merged with a company. And then ultimately we got acquired by a company called Rational Software. And Rational was, uh, was a bigger company, also in the developer diagnostic space. I ended up with a big sales job, nice fat compensation package, and I realized at that point that there were sort of four things that I think everybody wants out of their, their job and out of their career. And write this down, because this will help you to recruit good talent. Uh, first and foremost is impact. People want to go somewhere where they can make a big impact. And I think that's why a lot of you are entrepreneurs and you, you're doing your own businesses, because Everything you do has an impact on the bottom line, and if you build a valuable business, it, that business could be impactful for the world. You have some great idea, you wanna make a difference for something, so I think it's impact. Second is growth and development. People wanna stretch themselves, they wanna learn, they wanna solve hard problems. If you don't, you'd go somewhere that's very stable, where you're not gonna learn a lot, and, uh, and be completely happy. But it's, I think it's impact, it's growth and development. The third thing is financial reward. And then the fourth thing is balance, whatever balance means to you. So it could be that you just love to surf and so you live here so you can surf and you want a lifestyle that's gonna afford you the opportunity to not miss a good swell. Nothing wrong with that. That's why, that's why it's up to each individual person to what degree they get those things. So I was at Rational Software and I, was, I had a big job so I was making a big impact. I had great growth and development because I went from a company that was half the size, all of a sudden you're acquired by this big company, and I had, the, I had a job that was twice as big overnight. They gave me a lot of responsibility at the new combined company, and I felt good about that. I had national responsibility, so I had a, what I call a seat at the table. The third thing is good financial reward. They were paying me very well, not only to do my job, but also to stick around for two years. They wanted to incent key talent to stay, and so they rewarded me to stick around. And then as far as balance goes, I, I liked the job. I was traveling, I was getting to see parts of the world I hadn't been to, and so the job gave me everything I wanted. But at that point, the founder of Pure Software was going off to start another company. And he invited me to be employee number three at that company, and I turned him down, because I didn't think his idea of sending DVDs via the internet was a good idea. And he founded another little company called Netflix, and to this day, I regret not taking employee number three at Netflix. And he had a compelling pitch. He said, listen, come work with us. And I go, well, what are you gonna do? You're gonna mail them? 
Like, what are you talking about? Like, why would you mail them? He said, people hate Blockbuster. This is going to be a huge business. The number of DVD players is going to increase tenfold in the next five years. This is going to be huge. And I remember saying, why don't you mail me an offer? Ha ha ha, you know, like laughing. <laughs> and I always regretted not actually taking the leap at that point. And the reason I didn't is because I, I really liked all of the things I had in my current job, right? But when Rational got acquired by IBM, I stuck around at IBM for almost two years. And for the first year, it was great. I had impact, same thing happened. IBM gave me a huge job. They upped my pay. They gave me sticking around money for two years. But I remember I flew up to Seattle to talk to um, uh, this guy, Dan Leventhan, who runs a fund for Howard Schultz, the founder of Starbucks. And Dan asked me, what do you want to do? And I said, look, I always regret not taking the Netflix job. And he said, well, Gary, you either have to change your environment or change your aspirations because you're never going to get the Netflix job as long as you're at IBM. You can't accomplish what it is you want to accomplish in a big company. You want more impact. You want more growth. You want to make more money. You want game-changing wealth, not a fat salary. He said, you might wake up one year and, you know, realize that you're going to have an alarm clock from IBM on your mantle, you know, after 15 years of service, and maybe you have a BMW, maybe a beach house, but he said, you're not going to be like me. You're not going to be a re really wealthy guy because you can't accomplish that at IBM. And I remember flying back from Seattle, I had a window seat on one of these small Alaska planes, and I was claustrophobic. I was like, I got to get out of there. I have to change my environment. So I think you have to assess those criteria and figure out what it is that you want. And I realized at IBM, I didn't have the growth and development I wanted. I had it for a year, merging a, a $700 million revenue company into a $20 billion revenue company it was exciting. And I was on the integration team and I learned a ton and I was getting leadership training in Armonk and all of that was great. I had no impact. My number was 200 million and it didn't matter if I showed up in the office or not. I like to say I had two metrics at that point, nine and five and nothing else really mattered. Uh, I looked at a job I could have five years out at IBM and I didn't want that job today. And the balance was good, the financial reward was good, but it wasn't game changing, it wasn't Netflix like money. So I left and decided to become an entrepreneur. We started a little company called IntelliBank, which was Dropbox done wrong. A lot of valuable lessons learned there, but it was a web dev interface, drag and drop artifacts into the cloud and share them with people, Dropbox. Uh, we didn't execute. And uh, from IntelliBank, I ended up at Odesk. We were trying to raise money for IntelliBank. And in the process, I met the guys at Sigma Partners, a VC firm up in Menlo Park in San Francisco and Boston. And um, they said, after the third meeting, they said, look, we're not gonna invest in IntelliBank. We like you, not the company. We like the idea, but we, we just think it's too hard to execute at this point. So we want you to uh, come over and follow money. We're gonna invest in this company. We want you to run it. So that's how I got to Odesk, and I have no regrets. I regretted for about two weeks leaving IBM when I realized that my benefits weren't as good. You know, with IBM, you, you show up at Hertz and you never get less than like an Escalator or a Volvo. You know, you, you fly business class everywhere. The, pre, the perks are fantastic, but the growth and development, the impact just aren't quite there. And I was willing to give up this you know, fantastic salary in order to put some chips on the table for a big win. And now seven years later, I, we still don't have that big win. <laughs> Things are going great and I, I have no regrets. I'm just much more alive because I have the other things that are important to me. So long answer, but I think it should give context to why it is that entrepreneurs do what they do. I think it, it has to do with those four things and I was starved for those at IBM. Any questions about that? All right. What's on our list? Well, I'm trying to go in order, Gary. Let's go, uh, how about create supply and demand? All right, so creating supply and demand. So marketplace businesses are about chickens and eggs. And I have a lot of open table and other business context. Open table, simple strategy. More restaurants, more diners. More diners, more restaurants. Odesk, more jobs, more contractors. More contractors, more jobs. eBay, more Beanie Babies, more buyers. More buyers, more Beanie Babies. Pez dispensers, Rolexes, cars, right? So in all of these marketplace businesses, it's a chicken and egg business. The question, and it's gonna dovetail into some of your questions, so we might hit multiple ones at the same time, is how do you create the initial supply and demand? And how do you know which do you get first, 
right? So you get chickens or eggs first, and then when do you open your door and say, we're ready for business? So for Odesk, what do you think is in more limited supply, jobs or talent? Talent. Talents in limited supply? Quality. Well, quality talent is tough, yeah. It's actually jobs. So with jobs, we can get all the contractors we want. So if you have good jobs, you can get quality talent. If you have quality talent, you can get good jobs. But for us, we pay to get jobs. Talent comes for free. But it didn't always start like that. We had to start by having some initial liquidity. And what we did in the early days is we hand matched talent with jobs. We, would, uh, we, we had a couple hundred developers uh, some we had used to help build Odesk, and we went to clients to sell them our management platform for, for monitoring and tracking time and paying, uh, paying talent, remote talent. And most of those clients said, that sounds like a really cool system, but what we really need is talent. Do you have any good Ruby on Rails developers? Do you have any good, uh, uh, good Java guys? And so we ended up placing people that we knew on those client assignments and from there, those clients would say, wow, this guy is so good, you have any more? And though, typically, those developers had friends. And they would invite their friends, and they would join the platform, and then they would tell others. And the next thing you know, we have an entire town in Russia with everybody in town working on Odesk for clients all over the world. And so we hand-matched in the early days, and we ensured a quality result by interviewing every developer that we bought onto the platform, and by interviewing every client that we bought onto the platform. So that's a really good thing to do in the early days because you have to ensure a quality result or you're not gonna earn the right and respect to go back and sell them more or to get more jobs, get more contractors. So in the early days, we, uh, not only would we interview every client, we would charge them 100 bucks on their credit card. We would say, look, it's a $100 deposit to work on Odesk. And we're gonna credit that $100 towards your first hour's work. And we use that as a filter to figure out who was really qualified. Like if you didn't have a hundred bucks, fully refundable. If you never hired anybody, we'd give you a hundred bucks back. But if you didn't have a hundred dollars, we didn't think you were serious enough. You may have been interested, but you weren't qualified, right? So you have to think how interested are they and how qualified are they? And similar for contractors, we would interview every contractor and make them ask us to get on the platform. And that was a measure of how interested were they. If they didn't want to talk to us for an hour, and how qualified are they? What answers did they give us in that interview? And that was good enough to get a thousand clients and a thousand contractors. The problem with that is that that's not gonna scale, right? So you can't afford to interview every single person that comes on your platform or every client. Um, but in the early days, it was really important for us to get that initial thing kickstarted. Let me chat about open table for a second. Restaurants or diners, what's harder to get? Restaurants? Yeah, in the early days, imagine that you only had two restaurants in Santa Monica and Venice on your platform. Why even bother getting diners? Diners are going to come in. They're going to say, oh, none of the restaurants are on it. Why even this platform sucks? So for Open Table, they had to actually go out and get restaurants before they could even open their doors for business. They had to have enough product on the shelf so that th when they open the doors to diners, there was enough inventory there that they could give people a good experience. And so it was incredibly expensive. And the other interesting thing about that business is that it's hyper-local. A restaurant in San Francisco does you no good in LA. So you have to go and build each market individually. So if you're considering or working on a marketplace business that's hyper-local, Open Table, uh, Zarly, TaskRabbit, um, Uber, uh, Airbnb, you know, well, Airbnb a little less so because people travel, but do you know what I mean? Like these businesses where for Airbnb, uh, not Airbnb, for uh, TaskRabbit, a dog walker in Venice does nobody any good in San Francisco. Where in our business is kind of interesting, a Java developer in Omsk, Russia can be available to everybody in the world. So very, very different um, uh, between supply and demand, also uh, quality. So I was with somebody the other night, they've got a marketplace business, um, 
Oh, it's called Take Lessons. Really cool business. It's for people that want to take music lessons via the, uh, locally. So you want a guitar teacher, piano teacher, voice teacher, whatever. You go into their marketplace. They're going to match you with the right teacher. They have feedback, reputation, all that stuff. But now this is somebody that's coming in your house to teach your kid. So you need quality becomes even more important, right? So you have to do incredible screening, background checks, um, you know, drug testing, anything that's going to indicate that this person really is of quality. So, um, so I think it is about supply and demand. You have to do it in, uh, in unison. You can't get so far out in front because, you know, in our business, um, if you go to contractors and you say, hey, just come on and join our platform and put up a profile and load a picture and samples of your work and then we're going to go get you clients, that's a big leap of faith on their part. It's going to be hard to do that. They're saying, well, what's in it for me? Why would I want to spend an hour doing all that work unless you have something for me? So you need a job to offer them as an incentive to come do it. And similarly for clients, if we open the door and say, hey, post your job and search our database and there are no Android developers, we've lost you as a client. It's going to be really hard to get you to come back and give us another try. So you have to go in unison, which dovetails into one of the other questions, which is horizontal versus vertical. For us in the early days, it was about very, very focused um, execution eBay started by selling Beanie Babies and Pez dispensers, not by selling Rolexes and cars. One, the world wasn't ready to buy Rolexes via the internet, and two, Beanie Babies were like a really viral thing. Once people found that that was the best place to do it, they became known for that, then collectibles. Well, if it's collectibles, why not watches? If it's watches, why not all jewelry? If it's all jewelry, why not big screen TVs? Why not cars, et cetera, right? Why not everything? So my guidance there is that it's easier to build liquidity if you focus in on one thing. I told the Take Lessons guy, he said, hey, we're thinking of adding, adding tutoring and yoga and you know, all these other things. And I was like, time out. Hmm. Like, just focus on entertainment. Like, maybe just guitar, right? Get known as the world's best place for that before you go into tutoring. Because what's your marketing message? What about your suppliers and your buyers? How do you it's just going to be harder to acquire horizontally. Um, I think it's a lot easier to, to acquire and build liquidity vertically. And there I would narrow the slice as small as possible, whether it be if it's hyper local, I'd focus on one geography. And I, my recommendation is go where the pain is most acute, right? So in the hyper local, Airbnb is a great example. They built 90% of their business in New York. Why New York? So why does New York make sense for Airbnb? And tourist attraction is expensive. Tourist attraction, very expensive. Tons of people want to go to New York. What else? Limited space. Limited space, right? Hotels are a fortune. We kind of talked about it, but apartments are so expensive. People are going to Hamptons on the weekend. They're not there. The apartments are so small. Once you pay to rent it, you can't afford any furniture. So you say, gee, I got some IKEA furniture in there. I'm paying all this money. If I could get 100 bucks a night while I'm not using it, that, that's huge. In the early days, um, Brian Chesky told me that the average host on Airbnb in New York, uh, guess how much the average host made in the early years at Airbnb? So the average host, that means if you're renting out your place in New York, how much was the average host making in the first uh, year or two of their business? Three thousand bucks. Thousand bucks? Five thousand. Five thousand, ten thousand, thirty-two thousand dollars. $32,000. And because they got such a following in New York and San Francisco and then Paris, people thought they were global. They only had three cities. 90% of their revenue was coming from New York. Hyper local, narrow focus, build liquidity there, deliver incredibly high quality and service, and you'll earn the right and respect to go into other categories. So for ODES specifically, in 2007, four categories accounted for 90% of our work. Mostly tech. We got known for tech. That's where the innovators and early adopters were. It's people online. They're in front of the web. Uh, huge supply and demand. Uh, it was easy to acquire both talent and clients when you get known for that one thing. So four categories in 2007, 90% of the work. 
In 2012, that was 37 categories accounted for 90% of the work, less than 60% of it tech. So we're getting aggressively pulled like eBay was horizontally because we earned the right and respect to solve four verticals. Now that we're getting big enough, the question about, you know, what do we think of verticals versus horizontal? Well, very similar to eBay, people want to buy a car slightly differently than they want to buy a Beanie Baby. And you can't really feature a Rolex watch next to a Beanie Baby because people's perception is that that Rolex is fake, can't be real, I'm gonna get ripped off, I'll buy it, you know, how am I gonna get my money back? Where a $10 Beanie Baby or Amazon, a book and a big screen TV, you buy them somewhat differently. So now that we have liquidity uh, more horizontally, we have to start thinking about a vertical experience because somebody may wanna buy a design or a logo differently than they wanna buy web development or SEO or customer service or telesales or whatever it may be. And we've got to solve each of those. And you know, somebody may show up at our website and say, okay, I'm a high priced uh, graphic designer. They show up and see $10 an hour software developer and they say, I'm in the wrong place, right? You want to buy a Mercedes, you see Hugo's in the window. They still make Hugo's. You see Kia's in the window and you're gone, right? So you have to think about your marketing, your messaging and liquidity by category as you scale. So, I mean, EV dealt with that, that, I mean, they, they took cars out and then they acquired a bunch of vertical business stuff up, et cetera. Yeah. So, how do you think around, you know, is, is ODAS, can, can you extend the brand to both kind of low end and premium, or do you need to pull out yeah. categories? Do you need to so, I actually just met, two weeks ago, I met the guy that did eBay Motors, and he told me the story. And I'd heard it before, but I validated it. It was just last week. I was in San Francisco, I was on a panel talking about marketplace businesses. <laughs> and uh, the guy who created eBay Motors was there. And what the story that I heard, which is true, is that eBay started seeing liquidity in these categories that they didn't expect. They were selling Beanie Babies and collectibles, and then they started seeing, whoa, a car. Well, what's a car doing there? It was a collectible car. And they were thinking, well, gee, if people sell collectible cars, why not any cars? So this guy had worked at Bain, and he created a 90-page business plan on how eBay should go vertical and they should create these vertical marketplaces. And they started hiring category managers to manage jewelry and cars and you know these other verticals. And the category managers said, okay, people wanna buy jewelry differently. This is what the product has to look like. This is what the marketing has to look like. This is what the experience has to look like. And they got teams of people that started defining the specs for these different vertical marketplaces. And then they showed up to the product team, which was horizontal, and said, okay, uh, I need the jewelry marketplace. Here's all the functionality we need for a jewelry marketplace. And the product and engineering team said, that's cool. Just get in the back of the line because we've got these 97 features that we have to do for everybody first. And so you just have to get to the back of the line. And so the eBay Motors guy shows up and says, okay, here's my plan for eBay Motors. And eBay says, that's cool, get behind jewelry because they're in front of you. So it's gonna be about a year and a half. And so this guy, without asking permission, he, he actually took, somehow he cobbled together a team of developers and they just built eBay Motors. Separate code base, separate functionality, completely didn't integrate with anything eBay. And then they showed it to somebody and they said, wow, that's pretty freaking good, go. Just go with that. So I think he said for like a million and a half bucks, they built the whole thing for eBay Motors. And it was, the reason why is because it was more nimble. They didn't have to build on an old code base. They didn't have to wait, worry about plugging into the infrastructure. They didn't have to worry about the same experience because it was a different experience. So with that in mind, you could say, well, gee, why, not, why does Nodesk do the same thing? We were smarter because one of our investors is Benchmark Capital. Bob Cagle has been on the board of eBay forever. Benchmark was one of the uh, original investors in eBay. And he told us early on, he said, don't build your platform so horizontally that you can't verticalize later. So we, from the start, built an open platform so we can API writing on top of our platform by just building a different front end and then plugging into this general infrastructure. So we, we think we're uh, better optimized. And now we're at the point where we're saying, okay, how do these people want to buy? 
Uh, we've experimented acquiring a little company called Media Piston uh, to give writing, um, uh, instead of you coming to Odesk, posting a job for a writer, hiring a writer, you come to Odesk and you say, just get it written. And you tell us what you want, you fill out an order form, we'll go figure out the best writer and give you written copy back. It's really hard, it's really hard to do. It's not, um, it's not as sticky, the net promoter score isn't as high, but we learned a ton in the process and we've learned things about how to better optimize for writing, uh, which is about six or seven percent of the work on Odesk to date. So we're, uh, we're learning as we're going. We think there are gonna be opportunities. The more general answer to the question is, and I think this will help frame it for everybody, think of our business on three dimensions, okay? On this vertical axis, if I had a whiteboard, I'd draw you this picture, but vertical axis going up is size of client, from extra small up to extra large, okay? You've got an x-axis going, going out to the side, uh, and that's type of service. We've been talking about that, right? What's the work type? And then this third axis down and to the left or right is, um, is where are they in the world? Right, so where is the client and where is the contractor? Because then here another example is eBay. You know, eBay's strategy was, okay, we have to go global, but the thing about eBay is it's hyper-local. It's not hyper-local, but it's generally local. Uh, I was gonna buy a road bike once and I found it, I found the bike I wanted, Trek Madone 5.2, I found it in the UK. And I was like, that's the perfect bike I want, but am I gonna buy this thing from England? And I immediately said, no, I'm not gonna bid on a bike from England. It's gonna get shipped over on a boat. I'm gonna have to pay for more for shipping. What am I gonna get a charge on my card for converting to euros? Uh, it may have different size parts. It's gonna take a month to get here. Forget it, I'm out. I'll buy a local bike and pay more, right? So there weren't a lot of people that were crossing a border with a transaction at eBay. It was Germany to Germany. So eBay got trumped because the Samoir brothers copied the eBay model in Germany, built up liquidity of the German market, and then eBay had to buy them for a few hundred million dollars later. So think of that third dimension for Odesk, where's the client and where's the contractor? Do we build it geographically? Or do we, do we let the work cross a border and focus on the US? So if you were to think about our business on those three dimensions, size of client, type of service, location of client and contractor. Today we're uh, mostly small to medium businesses. More than 560,000 clients and 90% of the revenue comes from companies with less than 100 employees. Work types we talked about, 37 categories account for 90% of the work, mostly technical but aggressively getting pulled into SEO, SEM, um, writing, uh, even legal, finance, theoretical physicist, any job that can be done in front of a computer, we're getting pulled out, and we're getting pulled more globally, right? So in 2007, 90% of the work came from the US. In 2012, less than 60% of the work came from the US. Thousands, hundreds of thousands of clients all over the world that we haven't done anything to go get them. So our, our strategy is to focus on the core, mostly small to medium businesses, mostly technical work now starting to expand into different categories and mostly onshore offshore where or work crossing a border not france to france germany to germany uk to uk uk to eastern europe germany to asia right that's been our strategy and so if that if you drew that diagram on a page with those three arrows we're just a tiny little nucleus in that in that diagram and we think that that in and of itself is a huge market, but ultimately we want to be in the middle of all remote work. I want the whole thing. I want all size clients, all work types globally. So if you were Odesk, which of those axes would you pursue first? Would you go to bigger clients? And by the way, we have huge clients. We have the largest search engine company in the world, the largest social networking, two of the largest e-commerce companies, largest software company, all using us, right? They come to us and say, we need a flexible bench. So should we go get more enterprise clients, like salesforce.com, in the early days selling to SMB, should we go start selling to Cisco and Merrill Lynch? Should we go categories and vertical, like uh, the question over here, or should we go more global so we don't have to buy 
Germany from the Samoa brothers or buy uh, Japan or China? Should we be going globally first? Which, which of those axes would you go first? Globally. You'd go globally? Why would you go global? I'd cover more ground quickly. Cover more ground. Build, you know, a uh, worldwide infrastructure of what, you know, signals back and forth, back and forth. Yeah. Plus, you know, you, you have the different exchange of currencies, and also you can get work for cheaper. You know, yeah, I guess you get a guy in India, it's going to cost you, you know, 10, 20, 25, 30 dollars. You get a guy over here, it's going to cost you 120, 100. Yeah, arbitrage of work crosses the border. I was in Australia a couple of weeks ago, which is an awesome country, by so the way. So it's nice to build the, the economies of countries, too, across. Yeah. We have 35,000 clients in Australia. We had never set foot there until two weeks ago. So, yeah, amazing. They spent $32 million on Odesk last year. And again, our first, we've done nothing to, like, to develop Australia. But guess what? It's time to start thinking about Australia. Uh, somebody said all. Well, I said enterprise. Enterprise. I think that and yeah. it's like you said, people already are in Russia and they're looking for the good job. So I would go enterprise because, first of all, I think that if you expect, like if I find a good job and tell my friends about a great job, if it's viral in that context, meaning outside of a company context, inside a company, it must be even more viral. Because if yeah. you convince, you know, accountant to use ODES for their staffing needs, then, you know, now, now the technology department is more fine. Probably. The question I might ask is how are you going to convince that company to use ODESK? Because now, oh, thank you very much. Because now you need, who's going to call that company? Well, now you need a sales force. And yeah. guess what? Sales reps are really freaking expensive. And if you want to burn through your cash, hire sales guys. And hire them too early. So imagine Benioff, Mark Benioff, in the early days of Salesforce.com, hiring sales reps to go call on Cisco. And what's that call look like? You know, Hey, CIO of Cisco, how'd you like to put all your customer data in the cloud? Hey, Mark Benioff, how'd you like to F off, right? Like it's not happening, right? It was too early. So what I worry about is that it's too early. The enterprises aren't ready to put their talent in the cloud. They're gonna ask questions like, what about my IP? Except I would check what the net promoter score is for, for companies like Manpower, yeah. where I, I would imagine they're actually pretty low, yeah. and that you have a real opportunity because they're probably not even that status. Yeah, the thing about Manpower is their route to market is high touch. It's back to early days of Odesk where you're talking to every client, you're taking them to like, you're taking them to like basketball games, you're schmoozing them, you got a huge markup, you're, you're billing them out at 100 bucks an hour with a 30% markup, and I don't know one startup in this room that would you ever consider, I mean, show of hands, who's using manpower, a deco, anybody? No, like it's B minus talent and you can't afford it. So the SMB is massively underserved. Remember I said go where the pain is more acute? The pain's more acute with startups. You can't afford. If you could afford to hire locally, you would. If you could find the talent, and you're not going to manpower. The, right? the talent's overseas. The talent's overseas, <laughs> right? I mean, let's be. I've been to Russia. Right. It's Belarus, especially. Right. So you got, you got big companies, and not that you shouldn't, because guess what? You know, uh, this very large search company in Mountain View is paying us a lot of money. We have thousands of workers who are on their flexible bench and they're using many hundreds every day and they're paying more than the 10%. Uh, our, our business model is 10%, they're paying more than 10%. So, the, and oh, by the way, we started in one group and now we're in seven groups. So there's very much a land and expand and while it's tempting, uh, it can be defocusing. And the one lesson I learned at IntelliBank where we were trying to do document management in the cloud along with workflow and provisioning and security down to the object layer and, 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 and we were trying to sell it to enterprises. We ran out of cash because the enterprises put a lot of demands on your business. Cisco may have wanted their CRM in the cloud in the early days, but they would tell Benioff to like add all this functionality and the next thing you know, you miss the SMB where the pain was quite high, right? And the categories we already talked about. So for us, we're really focused on the core recognizing that we can't be dessert topping and floor wax. You just can't afford to do everything. And the hardest job of a CEO is not, to, not what to say yes to, it's what to say no to. Because there is no shortage of things to do. And your people will try and do it all, especially if you whipsaw and try and get them to do everything. You can't. So you've got to prioritize and focus. And for us, it's deliver a great experience for mostly small to medium businesses, mostly technical work, mostly onshore, offshore, 
And that in and of itself will enable us to build a huge business, but you have to do it in priority order. Don't try and be the dessert topping and floor wax. So this is the worldwide or the category types? First is worldwide or category types. It's really neither. So uh, let me just give you the, the, the evidence that, uh, you know, by focusing on the core, we've done nothing to develop categories and we've done nothing to go global. We haven't gone and marketed globally. We haven't, uh, we don't have anybody on the ground outside of the US who's working on our behalf to acquire customers. Um, in 2007, 90% of the work came from the US. In 2012, it was less than 60%. So because we're doing a good job of focusing on our core, we're getting organically pulled globally. And now we're starting to do a little bit of PR. We still have nobody on the ground, but I was in Australia, I was in Germany, I was in London, I'm going back to London next week. London's fantastic, 43,000 clients on Odesk, and we're going back. Talk to clients, meet with folks like you, uh, talk to press, I'm on BBC next week. Those kinds of things are great for us, help us to get more known. Categories, four categories in 2007, 37 categories today, and just now we're starting to experiment with, is there some different marketing that works? Are there some different landing pages? We're dabbling uh, more to learn, but our primary focus is on the core business, right? As described. So I think I checked a bunch of boxes there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe why so long? Why so long? Why did I take so long yeah, to answer that question? So no. Yeah. <laughs> oh, not for the answer, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I, uh, I get on a roll, and I'm sorry if I'm running on here. I get really excited about this stuff. Why did it take so long? These businesses just take a long time. I mean, it's hard to build liquidity, right? I mean, you go from, and may I point out that our business has almost doubled every year in the last six plus years, right? So since 2009, we've grown eightfold. So it's not like we're growing slow, but you know, you start with a penny and then it's two cents and then it's four cents and then it's eight cents. It just takes time to get to, uh, to scale. And I don't know, I, you know, just in retrospect, I don't know how we could have done it any faster. You know, you have this, um, uh, you know, let me just talk a little bit about the history. We raised uh, $6 million in an A round. We bootstrapped the company on credit cards. We got to the point where we had a business, about 1,000 clients, about 1,000 developers. We, uh, we had the software for manage and for pay. Right? We had best replicated the way that work happens in the offline world, which is by the hour. Everybody before us had focused on gigs. Build me this logo and I'll pay you 100 bucks. Do this small job and I'll pay you 50 bucks. And in those kinds of businesses, disintermediation is rampant because you're really paying for the match. Think of match.com. You have to get a lot of money, allegedly, I've never used it. You have to pay a lot of money up front because if you're successful, you're never gonna have that client again, right? They're gonna get married and they're, they're not gonna need you anymore. Um, so you have to charge a lot of money for people to belong in order for you to have a valuable business. And so most of the marketplaces prior to us were focused on fixed price and charging either the buyer to post the job or the seller to bid on the job or they were asking for a fee on the amount of the job at introduction, right? Once you hire, we get 10% of that or whatever it is. And for that, we might keep the money in escrow and let you release the money from escrow when you get what you want. The problem is that those are really small jobs. Everybody knows 99 Designs. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool business. I love those guys. Really good guys. They flatline. They can't break through million, million five a month in logos because you, once you get a logo, how many lo more logos do you need? You get a logo done, you're kind of done. Maybe you need another design, but, and if you're a designer, you get sick of competing, one out of 100 people gets the reward, and so that means 99 people don't make any money. And if you're a serious designer, you say, I don't feel like working for free. So they can't break through that liquidity. So what we did was we focused on Everything that happens after the match is what we built first. Then when we connected people, they stayed sticky with us. So our business model was more like ADP, right? You get paid for every hour worked. I get proof that every hour, an hour worked 
is an hour paid for the developer or for the worker, and an hour billed is actually an hour worked for the client. And so our software is what the investors really like. They like the fact that we had a unique business model and a different way of working via the web, which uh, enabled us to raise six million bucks. For that money, we said, we're gonna, we're gonna invest this money and we're gonna grow it bigger. We're not really gonna change anything. Uh, at that time, our strategy was the same. More jobs, more workers, more workers, more jobs. And the three dimensions were in place six years ago and I said, we're gonna focus on this first. And then with that, we took uh, eight million bucks a year later, even though we had not spent the six. A good time to take money is when you don't need it, uh, especially if the investors are good strategic partners. Benchmark was a brilliant investor to have in Odesk. They invest in marketplace businesses, eBay, StubHub, uh, Grubhub, Uber, uh, they, they're the marketplace guys, right? Uh, U-Ship, um, Odesk, so we got the right investor in. Uh, two years later, we took another $15 million to continue to step on the gas. And then last year, we took another $15 million. Even though we didn't need it, we brought a strategic investor in, a guy by the name of Henry Ellenbogen, who manages a $10 billion fund at T. Rowe Price. And Henry invests in private companies that he thinks can be big public companies. So he's in Twitter, he was in Facebook, he's in Zillow, he was in uh, Zoom that just went public two weeks ago. So uh, Henry is an investor in Odesk. He picks about four or five private companies a year, and he's got $15 million in his front pocket. So we have $44 million in Odesk. We have a significant portion of that in the bank, and we're using that money to fund, uh, to fund the growth, right? So we're investing in product, we're investing in engineering, we're investing in marketing to continue this, more jobs, more contractors, more contractors, more jobs. So you kind of touched on this in every agent. Um, are there any other ways that you can keep people? I know because I use I use Odesk all the time, and I know that uh, you know you can just email back and forth once you get your contractor on yeah. email or whatever outside of the system. You um, can, yeah. So here's the way Odesk works. So you post a job, it's free. Contractors can apply to that job, it's free. We don't charge either side. So if you chose to cut us out of the loop at that point, we have no business. So uh, people do it all the time. Contractors invite clients and say, hey, let's, let's work outside of the loop. We have ways of figuring that out behind the scenes. We can see people that apply to a bunch of interviews but never actually get a job. Uh, we can see people, but yet they have really good feedback. We can see people that um, are working and then uh, pull it off. Now our contract says you're not gonna do that, but let's be real, people are gonna do that. What we have to do is we have to focus on adding enough value after the match so that you don't want to do that. And the way we think we do that today is with this time tracking and billing software. Amazing. So I, if I'm working for you, you're here in, in this is Venice, right? If, I'm in, if you're here and I'm up in San Francisco, in order for me to get paid, I have to log into your team room. Now as soon as I log into that team room, you get a screenshot of my desktop six times an hour at random intervals. So you know that an hour build is an hour worked. And not only do you know that an hour build is an hour work, but you can course correct me in real time. It's, it's as if I'm sitting in the cube next to you. And our clients love that because they know that they're not gonna get overbilled. They know that they're paying for actual time worked. If I go for a latte, I go to pick up my dry cleaning, I go for a surf, system shuts down. So you, the client, aren't paying. 40 hours is really like 32 hours on average. So right off the bat, there's 20% savings for clients right there. Our time tracking is really stingy. Marketing says accurate, I say stingy, right? I say accurate for contractors. So clients love that. They also love the fact that the billing just happens automatically. At the end of the week, they get an invoice. They know exactly how many hours were billed. They can audit it right there because we archive those forever. They can ask the contractor to remove any YouTube or any work that wasn't theirs. And it's just automated, it just works. It hits their credit card or their primary payment method and we pay the contractor regardless of where they are in the world. So you as a client could do that yourself if you trust the contractor, but what's to stop the contractor from saying, yeah, that was pretty much uh, 40 hours last week. Oh, you know what, no, Thursday I worked a little, make it 44. And next week it's 48 and then it goes up to 50. So we have clients that actually bring their contractor relationships onto our platform 
because they save money, it's, it's, uh, it's the time. Now, if you're a contractor, you love it because we guarantee payment to you. So you work 40 hours for a client. Client says, I don't like the work I'm not paying. We still pay the contractor. So by creating this guaranteed work for the client, we can't guarantee the quality or the speed, but we guarantee that an hour build is an hour worked. And we guarantee that an hour worked is an hour paid. So the contractor gets their money every week, whether we collect it from the client or not, and then let us go try and collect it from the client. Now, in addition to all of that, you've got the feedback, the reputation, you know, what are these clients saying about you, which enables you to go get other jobs. So we think we've built enough in the system to keep disintermediation uh, low, but it doesn't mean people will cut you out of the loop. But lowering your price, we're 10%. Lowering it to 5%, it's not going to, people are going to cut you out, they're going to cut you out. You got to focus on delivering value. One other thing I'll say is we built a global payment platform. So I can collect money in dollars and pay in rupee or peso or euro or whatever the contractor wants. And because we built this payment platform, we can collect the money and transfer the money into euro or peso or into, I don't know, 160 currencies. We can do it uh, as cheap, if not cheaper, than PayPal. So, and we can deliver the money faster. So contractors like it because they say in the Philippines, for example, it takes them longer to get their money and it's more expensive via PayPal. So Odesk is cheaper, better, faster. So if you deliver enough value in the manage and the pay, not to mention the statutory. So if you wanna take, um, if you wanna take the responsibility for figuring out statutory in the Philippines, go for it. Why not just let us do that for you? So we had enough value in the manage and in the pay and in the guaranteed work and guaranteed payment that um, uh, enable us to keep growing as a business. Personally, I, I mean, I put people on Odesk just to make it easier to pay them. Um, I mean, it's only 10%. And I found them elsewhere. It's brought them into Odesk just to make it easy for me to pay them. So I which actually, quick lesson here. Thank you for that, by the way. We're not, definitely not paying this guy enough. Scribe and shill for Odes. Thank you. But um, uh, in the early days, we were $6 an hour flat fee. So regardless of how much the worker made, we, we just added $6 for Odesk. And the revenues were great. In the early days when we were, you know, when we were bootstrapping and we were making cash, Six bucks an hour was fantastic until a client found out that the worker was charging six and Odesk was 100% markup. And they held it against us. They were like, you guys suck. This worker is so good and you're making too much money on their back. We don't like that. So we went to 30%. And 30% was good, but the problem was that it was still too much. I think we were inviting too much disintermediation at 30%. It was questionable whether we were adding enough value to justify 30%. We did have more touch then. This was still early days when we were speaking to clients and speaking to contractors. And when you speak to somebody and you have a relationship with them, they won't cut you out of the loop because they know Gary. They don't really care about Odes, but they know you. You spoke to them on the phone. You helped match them with the developer. When they had a problem, they could call you. That's why people don't cut staffing firms out of the loop. They feel like, I have a relationship with Joe. We can't chef Joe. When you're a platform, when you're an internet business, People don't give a damn. They're like, 30%? Who? That's a machine. Like, well, yeah, we don't have to pay that. So we went to 10% and our revenue dropped <laughs> significantly, but our numbers took off. And what we liked about 10% is it's simple. It's very simple to explain. And it's low enough that it would be hard for anybody to undercut us, right? So you could disintermediate, but you're not actually going to save that much money by the time you pay and by the time the contractor maybe ups his hours or I don't know you end up with a bad result or there's nobody there to support you or you end up with some sort of statutory complaint or some contractor ends up without getting his check and it's going to be hard for any other business to undercut our 10% and still make money right so open table has competitors that are trying to compete at a lower price but the margin is so small it's it, it's hard for those businesses to keep that machine going without raising a ton of cash. It's going to be hard to raise a ton of cash if you don't have a better business model. Did you guys um, have a lot of problems with the software, the, the, uh, the, the tracking software that, tra that tracks the activity um, with people maybe you know, logging in? On trying, the to game it. Yeah, trying to game it and double yeah. time it. 
Yeah, so the way our system works is that if I want to get paid, I have to log in. As soon as I log in, you now get the screenshot. Well, in the very early days when we were testing it out, somebody said, well, that's pretty cool, but I can just change my, I can write some software that'll just change my desktop. And we were like, oh, shoot. Okay, well, there goes that idea. And our founder said, no, 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 don't despair. We can fix that. We're going to count keyboard strokes and mouse events. Mm -hmm. So you actually have to be typing and moving your mouse. And then the hacker who was helping us said, that's not a problem. I'll just, I can buy a keyboard emulator. And we said, yeah, but we can see it in the, we can see it in the sys tray. We can see it when we get the screenshot, we can see you have this little thing running. See, there it is right there. And the screenshots are the same. And he goes, okay, I can fix that. So he hides the sys tray, he yeah. changes it. Yeah. And we're like, ah, shit. That idea. We're like, all right, now what do we need? And we go, aha, work memo. So we built Twitter, Twitter-like functionality in from the get-go which you as the client can say, you need to tell me what you are working on. You need to tell me, you need to actually type it into the computer. So now, to, not only do you have to be moving your mouse, typing your keyboard, getting your screen captured, but now you have to add a work memo at whatever frequency the client wants. So every time your screen is captured, we, a little pop-up comes up, almost like a you've got mail, and it says, you know, this is your latest screenshot, you have 30 seconds. You could delete it, so if you were, surfing YouTube or you didn't want your client to see, you can delete it, but you're not going to bill them for that time. Right? It's going to show up as a blank screen. And your client could say, I want to work memo every time. Client could say, that's distracting. How about twice an hour, just tell me what you're working on. And that work memo turns out to be really valuable because now the client can run a report that shows the sum of all of those work memos, you know how much time was spent on that feature or that functionality, you know how much money you're paying, you now get cost per feature, cost per thing. And we use it internally, we've integrated it with our bug tracking system, so I know how, what, what's the most expensive bug so far this week, right? Because our developers are telling us, right? So, uh, but that still wasn't enough because what happened was people were getting jobs on Odesk and then they were giving it to somebody else to do. So it was the old bait and switch. I'm gonna use yeah. my profile to get somebody and then I'm gonna give it to some junior woodchuck to actually do the work. So we added a camera. And so you, when you get a screenshot, you get my picture of me working at my computer with the keyboard strokes, with the mouse events, with the work memo, with all the stuff. So the sum of all of those things has never been gamed. And we have, some we have one client that came back and said, I found gamesmanship. Somebody was emulating, somebody was doing this, they had rotating work memos, and we said, congratulations, you, you win. And the guy said, you know what? He had spent $30,000 on Odesk, he wanted all of his money back. And so we asked the guy, we said, uh, how happy are you with the work? He goes, I love the work. He goes, the guys are great. He goes, I'm so disappointed that they're gaming me and I have to fire them. But I said, I love the work. I've, and do you feel like you're getting value? I'm getting tremendous value, even at the gamed, even with the game software, and I'm like, so, you win, because how are you gonna find this out without our software? Like, that's the beauty of Odesk. Yeah. You, you win, like, fire them and go get somebody else, but how would you have found this if you didn't have our software? You wouldn't have, right? You'd hire some agency somewhere and they'd be charging you 50 bucks an hour and playing, paying some guy in the back room seven, and you'd be paying a lot more money to get great work done, right? Yeah. So the sum of all of that has never been gamed. Competitors? Competitors, so uh, kind of dovetails into that last answer. What we did that nobody else had done is we had best replicated the way that work happens in the offline world. Most of us get hired and fired based on our results, but we get paid based on our time. And so from the very beginning, we built a system for time-based work, saying that's the way the real world wants to work. It's too hard for us to say, I'll tell you what, uh, our friend right here is a lawyer. Every time you do this thing, I'll pay you 50 bucks. And then when you do that, fill out that paper, I'll pay you 200 more bucks. And then when you do this, I'll pay you another 250. We're like, it's too hard to spec it and to negotiate and this and that. We say, you know what? We're just gonna pay you by the hour. We're gonna trust that you're gonna do great work in those hours, right? So while some jobs lend themselves to fixed price, with web-based work and with real work, it's too hard to spec it. It's too hard to get everything in the box on that thing. So fixed price jobs, 60% of the time, end up in a dispute or at least with a winner and a loser. So I underbid the job and you win because now I've got to do all that extra work for no money or 
I overbid the job and you lose because I finished it in 27 minutes and I told you it was going to take three weeks. Right? So there's, there's always a winner and a loser, usually a winner and a loser, and it's just too hard for serious jobs. So the way we differentiated from the get-go was give the match away for free, don't charge the buyer or the seller, let them get started, make money after the match, focus on individuals, not on companies. We're going to connect individuals with companies, not companies with companies, and, then, um, and focus on time-based work. And because of that, Odesk is the market leader today for any company that's in the online workspace. Odesk is bigger than the next largest competitor by a factor of two. So we're twice the size of Elance uh, because Elance focuses on fixed price, not time-based work, mostly companies charging for everything that happens up front with little value after the match. Uh, we're bigger than the next 10 competitors in the space combined. Uh, and we think it's because we have a better business model and, quite frankly, because we've executed uh, better. By the way, a lesson I learned in Australia is don't go in swinging a big stick. We're the biggest, we're the best, we're twice the size of a competitor. They have a syndrome over there called tall poppy syndrome. And they say, come on, mate, when the, when the poppy gets bigger than all the rest, chop it off, give some to the underling, give some to the other guys. Like, let everybody, mm -hmm. let everybody win. So I go into Australia like, you know, we're the biggest and I... Somebody pulled me aside and said, be careful, Mike. Don't, don't do that. So, <laughs> anyway, if you're going to Australia, just fair warning. Something, yeah, yeah. something good to know. Yeah, kind of go hand in hand. Okay. Uh, are you guys profitable, and what are your future plans? So we talked about future plans. As far as profitability, um, right now we are choosing not to be profitable. Uh, it's true. And I think you as a business have to decide what it is that you want to do. So I'll dovetail this into a, a, a longer answer to a different question, but let me answer this first. We're not profitable. We're choosing to invest in the business. Why? Uh, because we think it is a huge market opportunity and we don't want to miss it. Uh, we think this is a winner take all, maybe a winner take most uh, market, and we just don't want to miss the opportunity. So for us, we're investing in product, we're investing in engineering. We talked about the three directions we could go. We'll go in all of those directions once I feel like we've done a su sufficient job for the core. Uh, but I don't think we're out of market for the core. I think that we're just not even scratching the surface of what's possible for small businesses, mostly um, tech work types, uh, onshore, offshore. Uh, once we do that, we'll continue to invest in these other areas. So we're, um, we'll burn uh, cash this year, but we have a lot of money in the bank. Right now, I would argue that if we were trying to be profitable, we'd be under-investing in the opportunity, okay? Uh, our plans, I told you what our plans are. Uh, for your business, I think it's important to recognize what kind of business you want to be and what it is that you want to do. And for Odesk, from the very beginning, we realized this was a huge market opportunity, one that we didn't want to squander. So we said, this is going to require a lot of cash. And every time you take money, it, for that money, you basically commit to the investors what it is you're going to do with that money, right? So you go in, you say, look, I've got this business idea. This is what we think the market is. Here's the pain. Here's how we're different. And if you give us X million dollars, 1 million, 5 million, 10 million, 20 million, whatever it is that you're raising, this is what we're going to do with that money. Even if it's a small amount of money, give us 200 K and we are going to build a team, uh, of three developers and we're going to produce the product and for that 200k we're going to have a product that's ready to go to market or we have a beta product we're going to go get our first 10 customers that's what we're going to do uh, with the money whatever the whatever it is that you're going to do with the cash you kind of have to have an idea as to what kind of business you want to build and from the very beginning Odes said we're swinging for the fences we're going big but I want to tell you a story about a local VC who I know well because he tried to buy our company in Telebank. And it's a guy by the name of Mark Schuster. Do you guys know uh, Schuster over at uh, G yeah. GRP? So Mark and I met. He was the CEO of a company called Build Online. And Build Online tried to buy in Telebank. And we couldn't get it past uh, their investor, GRP. GRP was an investor in Build Online at the time. And Mark really wanted our functionality because we had built a great team, we had built a great product. He was living in the UK. And Build Online had mostly European customers. They were trying to break into the US. So they thought the product synergies were great. And if they bought Intellibank, they would pick up a US team. They would pick up me, 
and a handful of people that could have basically helped build online get into the US market. And so they, there were really great synergies between our product and Mark's company, Build Online, which was construction management. It was all about managing projects in the cloud. We had built a really nice software package for managing artifacts and documents and the like in the cloud. So he wanted to put the two together and get a better product and US synergy. Couldn't get it past the investors. So Mark said, listen, why don't we, you guys have built such a great product, why don't we strip it out and we'll do something else. We'll create another little company and we'll take the product, we'll strip out all this heavyweight stuff and why don't you come join us and we'll go do that. And I said, Mark, thanks, I'm a little burned out on this. I'm gonna go over to Odesk, but I think you should do that. So I think it's a great idea and I think you should take these three guys with you. So he took Donnie, John, Sanjay, took four or five people from the IntelliBank team and they created a little company called Coral, K-O-R-A-L. And um, uh, so they, uh, Coral, they end up selling Build Online, Mark spun out Coral, and Coral was an instant success. It was actually Dropbox, but they were going after enterprise clients and they stripped out all the heavyweight stuff that IntelliBank had. And Mark called me and he said, hey, we're thinking about taking funding from Emergence Partners. Emergence is a little Bay Area firm and they invest in SaaS businesses. And then Gordon Ritter, who's a partner at Emergence, called me and said, hey, it looks like you know this guy Schuster. What do you think of him? We're thinking of investing. And then Mark called me and said, I also need a sales guy. Do you have a sales guy? Because th things are going gangbusters over here. We got to start selling more of this. And all these great things were happening. And in a matter of weeks, Mark didn't take the funding from Emergence Capital, and he, instead he sold his business to Salesforce.com for low double-digit millions, call it 14 million bucks. And the reason he was able to sell his business to Salesforce is because he didn't take the funding. Had he taken the funding, million, two million, five million bucks from Emergence, he never would have been able to sell that business and then become a VC today. And the reason he didn't take the funding is because he had already been down that path with Build Online. They had taken tens of millions of dollars, nine years of his life invested into that company. He had handcuffs on. So in order for me to get out of Odesk now, I've got to return $44 million to investors plus, plus a significant <laughs> profit. So we're swinging for the fences. Like we wouldn't have taken that incremental 15 in a C round or 15 in a D round if we didn't think this was a billion dollar plus opportunity. And if we're in it for the long term. So the more cash you take, the less options you have. I don't mean the less stock options, I mean the less options for your business. So the bigger the ball. The bigger the the bigger the, the playing field. You keep stepping up to the big leagues. It's like you go from the from the you know the the, the dirt parking lot to the minors to the big leagues. I don't even know the sport, that's probably a horrible <laughs> metaphor, but you know what I mean, right? And I think the Schuster example, even if I didn't tell it well, was a great example because he had no handcuffs. He could decide to sell to Salesforce. It was a great outcome for him. It was a great outcome for his team. It wasn't a home run. It was a solid single or double, but it set Mark up for the next thing, impact, growth and development, financial reward balance. He's, got a much, he's much better suited for what he's doing now. And this was a stepping stone to get him there. And it was a great outcome for his team because that 14 million bucks was, they did that in less than a year, right? So you think about your return on your investment, it was genius, right? And I don't think he would have known to do that if not for his build online experience, right? One caveat, maybe, and maybe Mark comes in here and speaks one time, or maybe I'll ask him myself, but I'm wondering if he ever thought, shoot, I had Dropbox. I could, this could have been billions. It could have been, right? I mean, they had a beautiful product. It was, uh, it was amazing. They had great early traction. So I wonder if he ever regrets saying, gee, I sold too early. But, you know, experience is what you get when you don't get all the other things you want. And I offer this piece of wisdom only so you consciously go into, if I take the money, am I going to hit that milestone? Am I going to have the same options, right? The same exit options or the same out. Uh, and just recognize that you either have to swing big or know that you're not swinging big and consciously swing small and swing small could still give you everything you want, right? Uh, maybe your goal is to build a nice little business and 
uh, and you know sell it to Amazon or uh, or Facebook or you know whatever it is and have a nice uh, a nice uh, a nice outcome for yourself. When you are looking to um, expanding to buying verticals, what do you look for in positions for a vertical? So the question is, if you're looking to buy a vertical, what would you look for? I think this is really tricky because acquisitions are really hard to pull off. We did acquire a little company, and I'd argue that we, we didn't execute it well. So I think you're looking for synergies. You're looking for one and one equaling three, not one and one equaling something just north of one or maybe south of one. And I, you know, you can think about, like, let's think of a one plus one equals 10, uh, eBay and um, PayPal. Let's think of a, a one plus one not, equally, not even equaling one, uh, eBay and Skype, right? They thought, gee, if we have this communication platform, buyers and sellers will connect and we'll sell a lot more stuff. It didn't really work out. Now, in the end, it worked out because a private equity firm bought it for a lot more than they paid for it and then took it private, retook it public, sold it to Microsoft for a ton of money, and it worked out well for everybody in the end. But it wasn't synergistic with their business. And you have to think of the distraction, not only the distraction of integrating but is there a technology stack that has to get integrated uh the communication the teams the people the just all of the complexity of rolling something in there would have to be synergies so for odesk uh, i would look for synergies in the value that we deliver after the match are there synergies that we bring the clients and the contractors that make it sticky and if you're buying it for the liquidity, you would, have to buy, you would have to buy a lot more clients than contractors. So we would have to buy a lot more jobs uh, than we would contractors, or we would have to buy a market that we're not in today. Open Table <coughs> bought a player in Europe because it basically bought him Europe. So could, would we buy a geographical play of somebody who's executing? Right now, there's nobody who's executing globally in any uh, country more than us. Um, there's some guys in Latin America who are doing something pretty cool, but it's fixed price, charge for the match, it's a different business model. And with a different business model, you have to think about, well, what do you do on day one? So let's just say that Odesk were to acquire uh, somebody that had the pay-to-play model, where they charge for the job post or they charge the contractor to, for bids and you buy a certain number of bids per month or they're charging for ads. And if we bought that, how do you then integrate that? Do you then do that for your whole business or do you just keep it for that piece that you bought? And if you do it for your whole business, does that change your business model? And if you shoot it for the other business, did you just shoot the revenue that you, you just bought? So you have to think about the synergies of the business. So for us, it would have to be a value after the match, right? Are there things that would add so much value that it would keep the buyer and the client sticky, it would get them to do cross-sell and upsell, it would be uh, it would be more. With that said, if there were tremendous uh, vertical liquidity in a, in a business, that could be interesting, right? So uh, whether it be a geography or, or a specific vertical, we haven't seen it yet. Why? Because these businesses take a long time to build. Did we get everything? Yeah. So I, I feel like I rambled on. Uh, um, is this valuable? Did we hit? Okay. Awesome. Good. Good. Good.